So this session is, is what I've called uh, NFPA 101, a roadmap, and it's the basic, how do you even get started in figuring out what the applicable requirements in the life safety code are to whatever building you're doing? Uh, because most people jump into the code, inspectors are guilty of this as well, not just in the life safety code, but in the IBC, et cetera, of picking and choosing their code sections. Of going, well, this section says da da da, so you have to do it. So, that's not the way it works. There is actually a very, very specific set of, um, or specific order of uh, sections you need to go through and steps you need to take in order to actually figure out what sections are required. Once you get it, once you've done it several times, it, it, it's not difficult and it becomes uh, second nature. But to those who are not familiar with it or just don't know the basics of it, it's very confusing of which sections do I look at? There's so many different chapters and does this also, you know, does this chapter always apply or does it just parts of it apply or it is actually spelled out. So this is sort of the, the basics of what I'm going to try to talk about. So the topics are very simple and that is what are the chapters in NFPA 101? Just so you understand the basics between a core chapter and this occupancy specific one. And then, okay, how do you get from point A to point B within the life safety code? And I'm not going to talk about all the different reference standards that go along with it, other than how do you get to them from the life safety code, which is relatively you know, simple. And I'm also not going to get into a lot of specific systems. I'm not going to get into specifics on the chapters yet. This really is just to talk about how do you get from one chapter to another, um, and then why do you have to go to one chapter versus another. And it's always good to have your requisite comedic relief. Um, I like this one. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to deliver it as well as he can. There's a lot of PowerPoint, a lot of Dilbert PowerPoint uh, cartoons. <laughs> Seems to be a very common theme of death by PowerPoint or PowerPoint, po PowerPoint poisoning is the other one that's used quite a bit. Okay. Core chapters, and this is, the this is what they describe in the Life Safety Code Handbook a lot. Your core chapters are 1 through 4 and 6 through 10. These, these generally will apply to every building or portions of them. They are the non-occupancy specific chapters. You'll notice there's a space there. Number 5 is the performance based option, which we talked about in a previous seminar. Of sort of throw out all the prescriptive requirements, do it based on scenarios. So they throw that one out in terms of a core chapter. All of these other you know, uh, nine chapters in some way or another are applicable to the specific building you're working on, but not necessarily in their entirety. And that's where this, or, this, this order and, and how you get from point A to point B comes into place. Then there's the special chapters. One is that, let's say, the performance-based option one. The other one is in regards to very specific buildings or very specific kinds of structures. Uh, special structures, high-rise buildings is what they describe it as. It's open, wide open structures. You know, you've got stadiums that are wide open. You've got um, atriums, or not atriums, um, you know, various different shade structures, all these kind of things that don't really fall within an occupancy classification. Then you've got large towers, things, you know, what do you do when you have a boathouse? Well, it's hard to classify all you know, the requirements around that. Uh, piers, vessels, the life safety code actually looks at boats. It's one, of the few, it's one of the few codes that actually concerns itself at all with marine vessels. Um, the building code doesn't look at marine vessels for obvious reasons, it's a building code. <laughs> um, and then high rise structures is another one. There's some. As we talked about before, there's so many things that are very specific to a high-rise, it's got its own set of rules um, in addition to everything else in the code. Um, and then permanent membrane structures, a lot of these tent structures, uh, the, newer, you know, uh, the newer Denver airport it's a, with all of its you know, swooping uh, tensile structures, those don't quite fall into any construction category uh, necessarily, so there's some additional requirements on those. Um, and I just like that picture of that pier. So, okay, specific occupancy chapters. I'm not going to go through them all. You can see really quickly. These are all the different basic occupancies that the code recognizes or groups various functions within. Um, you'll see the 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. You'll see where they're paired together. That's new and existing. New and existing. 
So the code looks at, you know, new assembly is 12, existing is 13. New healthcare is 18, existing is 19. It puts them right next to each other for the most part. It doesn't look at ex existing one and two family residential. For most jurisdictions, don't even look at the NFP 101 as it pertains to single family residential anyway. But they really don't look at existing. There's an awful lot of that. So, um, but in general, they do have it existing or new and existing for most uh, most occupancies. And there's a number of them that are reserved for future use. Is why you'll see some skip, uh, chapters skipped. There's nothing in those chapters, at least as of the 2000 edition of the Life Safety Code. Um, and now in newer editions, the 03, 06, 09, and 12, they have updated some of these. They've changed some of the, the chapters around a little bit. But the same basic concept of new and existing occupancy-specific chapters has not changed from the 99 to the 20, 2012 um, life safety code. Okay, so the basics of nav navigation is actually spelled out in the appendix uh, in the life safety code. So it's not, this is not something taken from a handbook. It's actually, in, it's technically not the code in terms of the steps to go through, but it's in the appendix, which is, you know, extra information, but it's given within the code, if that makes sense. So first step, you figure out what occupancy you are. That's, if you don't know what you're building, you can't figure out what the minimum requirements are. Seems pretty straightforward, but understanding, is it a business occupancy? Is it a mercantile occupancy? Is it a, you know, is it a healthcare or is it a residential board and care occupancy? That's gonna be, that's a lot of it's gonna come down to the AHJ or the definitions uh, in chapter three or chapter six where it talks about what specific occupancies are, what chapters that go underneath. The next thing is, is it new or existing? And I'm gonna talk just really briefly about what defines new and existing. But you need to know if it's healthcare, is it 18, chapter 18 or chapter 19, is it new or existing? It's pretty darn important to understand that. Because if you don't, you get the whole code wrong. I mean, every, everything you look at is wrong if you don't know whether you're new or existing. The next thing actually is, you get, it seems a little bit backwards because you gotta get into one of the core chapters in order to figure it out. You need to know your occupant loads. Are you talking about a building for five people? Are you talking about a building for 5,000 people? It's going to make a difference as to how you address a lot of things in the code. Uh, and so that's one of the next, the next steps is just to figure out how many people are gonna be in this thing. And then the next is hazard of contents and chapter six talks about that. You know, are you storing high, high combustibles? Is this a sleeping occupancy? Are, is it a transient one? I people are only there for less than 24 hours or are there 24 hours or longer? Uh, do you have high pile, you know, hazardous storage? Is it an aircraft hangar? Or are, you know, we're just talking about people. Makes a big difference as to whether, uh, what, how the code, you know, addresses it. So you do need to know the hazard. It, the hazard of the contents in generally will follow right along with the occupancy classification, which is why they're under the same chapter. Uh, the code pretty much correlates a lot of the two together. Okay, new versus existing. This is very straightforward. It's actually, uh, I've actually had conflict or people that have misunderstood this, but it's pretty straightforward. Any building that's built, authorized, or erected prior to the adoption of a code is existing. So if in 2004, which is when CMS and the Department of Aging Disability Services adopted the 2000 Life Safety Code, so it took four years to adopt it, that date that they officially adopted it, now you're split. Everything before that is existing. Everything after that is new. Everything after it, doesn't matter if it's 20 years down the road, it's still new until another code's adopted. That's the key. Because they can't adopt a new code and say, oh, by the way, everybody 20 years prior, you need to meet the new section. That doesn't work. That's the whole point of having an existing section. Now, if we, so in this case, DADS and CMS adopts the 2000 edition in 2004. If in 2016, they adopt the 2012 version, the date they officially adopt it, everything prior is existing. Everything after is new. So the fact, just because you've gotten approved or you've gotten a CO or you've gotten licensed makes no difference to existing and new. It's all, does it before or after the code was adopted? That's all it cares about. 
Dads recently went from the 1988 edition of the Life Safety Code for Assisted Living Facilities to the 2000. So in the regulations, it now stipulates existing and new. Because they changed their code, they have to recognize everything prior can't be called existing or can't be called new anymore. It's now existing. This is a big confusion as, well, the building's been there for two years, so it's existing. Not if the code hasn't changed in those two years, it isn't. That's really important. That you still have to meet the new, as no, even though you still exist. <laughs> you know, that seems simple, but it's un misunderstood by a number of people. Okay, so what do you do after you figure those first four steps of hazard and your occupancy classification, etc.? You go to the specific occupancy chapter. That's the next step. You don't go into you don't go into sections uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You don't go to those first. You go to the occupancy specific chapter first, and then it specifically goes through those various requirements. And it'll say, okay, in regards to egress, you must meet these sections of chapter seven. Doesn't now it might say you must meet all seven. Okay, then all seven applies. But if it says the doors must meet sections, da, da, et cetera, et cetera, uh, except for these things, you follow the occupancy specific chapter to, to the letter of what it says. If it has the ability to amend basically anything in the core chapters or say what portions or what portions you're not supposed to follow in that core chapter. And you'll find a lot of them that just says, you know, Doors must meet chapter seven. Okay, then anything it says about doors in chapter seven, you gotta meet it. But if it just says door shall meet 7.5, well then 7.4 doesn't apply to doors. So it's all, it all depends on what that occupancy specific chapter says. Now, the occupancy specific chapter also has requirements that aren't in the core chapters. So there's some, especially there's some um, introductions within every occupancy specific chapter that talks about concept, purpose, etc. for those occupancies, that stuff is totally separate from the core chapters. One of the biggest problems we run into or misunderstandings is, well, ch you know, chapter seven egress is there, so then it all applies. I can go pick a section out of seven that says, this, this is required, therefore you gotta do it. Only if required by that occupancy specific chapter. Because it might be modified, it might be it might not be an option, or it might not even be a requirement, based upon that occupancy specific one. And I'll give you I'll give you a quick example here, but this is a big misconception that well, chapter seven applies to everything, or chapter nine applies to every building. No, it doesn't. Only if the parent chapter, that occupancy specific one, tells you it does. So here's a couple from new healthcare occupancy that of just a couple of examples, just two examples. And the first one is on means of egress. So it states that every aisle passageway, corridor, exit discharge, exit location access shall be in accordance with chapter seven. So it, right there it just says all of chapter seven. Exception, so except as modified by following 18.2.2 through 18.2.11. So they basically, these next uh, uh, nine sections, or 10 sections, modifies a few portions of chapter seven. So it says, okay, you must meet all of chapter seven, except where we've just modified it in the following sections in, eight, in this chapter. So if you were just to go to seven, it, you're gonna get it wrong unless you've read the amendments, basically. You've read the occupancy specific requirements to that section. And you'll find this in healthcare is a good example. Minimum corridor width in chapter seven is going to be 36 inches. Well, in healthcare, in hospitals or in nursing homes, it's eight feet. So if you were just to say, okay, it's per chapter seven, I got a three foot corridor, I'm fine. You're in serious trouble when you try and go get your building approved because as modified, no, it's eight feet is the minimum. And then there are certain things allowed in various portions of seven, eight, and nine that aren't permitted in occupancies. There are certain protections for vertical openings in healthcare that are, not per, that, are in, that are in chapter seven. So in one occupancy, they may be okay. In healthcare, they're not because they specifically say in that, in that chapter 18, this 
It's not permitted. There's a number of them like that, like openings per, uh, between three floors. You can't do it. You can't do an op unprotected opening between three, three floors. There's a number, I mean, and I'm just sort of paraphrasing, but there's a number of them like that. So here's the next one. In the, in the occupancy chapter for new healthcare, it says provide a fire alarm system in accordance with 9.6. It doesn't just say in accordance with 9. It sends you to a specific section of chapter 9. Then 9. Point, and I picked, there's some initial sections that are sort of generic summaries of what 9.6 talks about in terms of fire alarm. Then it sends you to 70 and 72. So now it's, this is how you sort of get from A to B, is that you went to, you figured out your occupancy. I know it's healthcare, it's new, because it's after the adoption of the code. They haven't adopted a new one. This particular section in 18, because you must meet all of 18 if you're healthcare, it says go to 9.6. 9.6 says, okay, you've got to meet these sections of the code right here, or these other standards, being the National Electrical Code and the National Fire Alarm Code 70 and 72. Now, by reference, those are now required under Chapter 18. And if you go farther into 9.6, it'll tell you specifically what kind of a fire alarm system is required, and it has to be installed per those codes. So it's all line itemed out in those, in those sections of Chapter 18. Now, so Chapter 19 doesn't apply. If we're doing this healthcare or a new healthcare occupancy, you can't go and pull something from Chapter 19. One other item that I talked about, I didn't get into specifically, mixed occupancies. When you're figuring out what your occupancy is, the most stringent applies. So if, let's say you have a new healthcare occupancy and it's got a large assembly space in it. If that assembly space is over a certain size, it's still, that is, it's, it's its own occupancy and you must meet the requirements for that assembly space. But if the healthcare requirements are more stringent, then you just follow the healthcare. But if it's, to this, if it's to a point that the, the assembly occupancy requirements are, are more strict, then you also follow the assembly ones. Whatever is the most strict between two occupancies in the same building, that's what, that's what applies. Now each chapter also talks about miscellaneous uh, or ancillary uses um, within each space or within each occupancy. And if, it, if that particular use, let's say assembly or storage, falls within the, the limits that the specific chapter talks about, then you follow those. If it doesn't fall within those, it's a separate occupancy and you have to treat, uh, treat it as such. But the key here, and, and this, is, this is really the extent of this seminar, is to understand not all parts of the course chapters, core chapters apply. You must go to your occupancy specific chapter first. That's how you get to everything else. If you can't get to a section of one of those core chapters through the occupancy specific one, it doesn't apply. So you can't just pick a section of eight and say, yep, that says you gotta do such and such to the smoke walls, therefore that's what you gotta do. Not unless you can get to it via the occupancy specific chapter. It just doesn't apply. You'll see in the code all the time where required elsewhere in the code. That phrase turns up in the billing code, and it, it, or it says just where required. Where required is where required by another section, or where required by that occupancy specific section. Not required by the HJ because they made it up, that's, and that's not acceptable either. It's where required by another section of the code. You can, I always, one of the things I always make, one of the things I always state when people sort of just come up with sections of the code that they like as well, this I think this fits. It's like, well, you can't get there from here. You can't get to that section from the cha this chapter. Therefore, it does not apply. If you can find me how you get there, okay, we'll talk about it. But I can't just say, well, you've got to meet the standard for diesel generators if you have a gas generator. Because there's a section in there that says, okay, if you have a gas-fired appliance, you go with that standard. If you have a diesel or a one, and you have you know, flammable liquid stored, then that another one applies. But you can't just take requirements for one code and put, you know, at, you know, apply them to another unless it's required elsewhere in one of these sections. So um, it seems really straightforward, but 
a lot of people don't quite get that one. Um, <laughs> this particular cartoon, this is a pet peeve of mine in, in movies where somebody hits the fire alarm or turns one sprinkler on and they all go off. Same kind of thing, you know, yeah, you can go ahead. The idea that you could turn the sprinkler system on <laughs> whenever you feel like it. Um, does anybody have any questions in regards to, I mean, the code seems like a very huge obstacle to so many people. Like, I'm amazed contractors and owners alike go, you know, it's, it's just too much. Hmm? And inspectors, it's just so much. But no, it's a very r simple process of following the, you know, the crumbs. It just says, you start here, go to your specific one, it will take you to every code required. There's nothing, you know, nebulous about it. Now, the regulations we run into can be. There's, because they're written differently. They're, not, they're written by a totally separate group than, that, than those who write the code. In fact, they're very often written by people that have no idea about codes, especially in the state. You have separate policy and regulations groups that write them. Now, they are edited by people that are and do know what they're doing, but things slip through. Simple, you know, one or two words in legal language can make a huge difference. Shall or may are two very different, you know, that's a, well, you don't have to if you want to, or yet you're going to do it. And it makes a huge difference, uh, especially when you're, re let's say, that's why most people don't write their own code. Because you screw up a lot of stuff and re require or not require a lot of things because you wrote the sentence wrong. And uh, the regulations, so we run into that a lot because it's not the linear progression. It's more of a let's just write everything down and well, it's somewhat categorized, but let's just write everything down that we want. And it's just sort of this huge laundry list. The code's not written that way, it is a very organized document and then all the standards that go with it. Very organized. So if anybody wants to complain about the regulations being confusing, that's understandable. They're, they are much more chopped up. Not the code. It's very straightforward. So.